Hello, our friends. First, we got to apologize because it looks like one of the panel members must have got the time wrong or something, but he didn't show up. Now, normally I would just continue the show without him. However, I feel quite bad over the fact that I made him read a 300 page book in a week and then not have him on to talk about it. That might be a little bit cruel. So we've decided what we're going to do is use this current episode more as a prelude to the Derrida episode, the Derrida episode proper. So what we're going to do is properly introduce the subject matter in the hand, because for example, we often hear that we use philosophical terms and vocabulary that are not quite so familiar to the audience. And so we don't give enough time giving the background so that you can follow what we're saying. So what we're going to do is do a prelude to the conversation. We're going to explain the background on some of this topic so that when we approach the subject next week, you guys will have a full, full toolbox at your disposal to use. So with that going, let's turn to our resident and fun Schmidt scholar here, Nils, and he will take us through the Schmidian Derrida relation. And following that, I will introduce I will introduce Derrida's deconstruction of Schmidt. So we'll jump right to you, Nils. Thanks a lot. Um, I believe Schmidt and Derrida did not have any personal relation, and it might sound strange to um, the usual Schmidt scholar and or Derrida scholar uh, that those two pretty different thinkers um, might actually have some tropes in common and uh, if not convening though uh, comparable views on certain philosophical matter. Um, Derrida should be more or less uh, a name that people know. Um, he's the more or less founder of the the school of deconstructivism and uh, has become kind of a meme in being that because in recent years uh, deconstructing stuff has become kind of a right-wing trope to use because people like Steve Bannon and uh, um, Marine Le Pen in in France talked about deconstructing uh, the the liberal or left-wing view on politics and stuff like that. And the fact that uh, left-wing intellectuals got pretty fluttered by that should be interesting enough because obviously there's something there to be discovered that they don't want to be found. But so far, all of this has been more or less just plain talking. And by talking about deconstructing uh, the left, those guys, uh, those people didn't really mean applying the, the philosophical framework of deconstructivism against uh, the left wing, which claims to, to uh, occupy this school of thought, but rather just uh, demantling it on a more or less economical way by cutting off uh, state funding from left wing institutions and stuff like that. But this time uh, we are trying to bring together uh, the original Schmidt and Derrida as he used to talk about Schmidt. And this is uh, very interesting, not only given uh, Derrida's personal background, he was born as a, uh, in a Sephardic Jewish family in uh, Morocco, I believe. Uh, no, no, of course it was Algiers because uh, uh -huh. Algiers back then depended, uh, belonged to France as part of the French homeland, even though it was um, basically just a colony. And because of this, uh, he was born in 1930 and uh, was, was uh, discriminated against by the Vichy authorities uh, during the, the Second World War. And this, uh, this became uh, more or less the 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 the, the founding uh, the founding sentiment of uh, his philosophical tackling of the concept of the other as an entity, and uh, this uh, fr from from him acknowledging the other as an as an as a, as a part of identity of personal identity various other uh, philosophical and political ideas sprung like uh, in, in uh, one of his writings 
called uh, Force of Law, he clarified that uh, the concept of equality cannot be the foundation uh, or basis or the prime mover of something like justice because when everyone's equal, you don't need no justice anymore because uh, justice is only possible when absolute asymmetry is given. So there is something to balance. And uh, this concept of the other being that fundamental to Derrida's thought and especially his concept of deconstructivism um, fits very well with Schmidt because there is a very, uh, b besides the whole uh, sovereignty and state of exception and uh, concept of the political stuff we talked about on, on the last stream, there is, there is a very famous quote that is often misattributed to Schmidt because he actually quoted someone else there uh, it is uh, it is in his uh, his rather small volume ex captivitate salus that means uh, within captivity uh, there is salvation and this small book uh, gathers some of the writings schmidt did while he was in custody in nuremberg and being questioned by robert kempner as a possible defendant for the later and smaller uh, secondary Nuremberg trials. And uh, the, the, the quote in question stems from uh, the, the essay Wisdom of the Cell, which uh, is from April 1947. And the paragraph in question reads, um, who am I able to accept as my enemy? I'm, I'm just uh, translating this right now as I, as I read it in German. Uh, who am I able to accept as my enemy? Obviously, only the one who is able to question me. And questioning someone is meant uh, not only by questioning him as, as Robert Kempner would do in Nuremberg, but also questioning him on an existential level, like challenging him to uh, a fight over life and death and stuff like that. And he goes on to relate this relationship to Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve had two sons, that was Cain and Abel. And this was the beginning of humanity. This is the father of all things. This is the dialectical tension that uh, keeps the world's history in motion and the world's history is not done yet after the Second World War, where obviously some people already thought the end of history had come that other people would uh, locate after the fall of the Soviet Union. And then uh, he quotes, without uh, saying where he got that quote from, the, uh, the poet Theodor Däubler, about whose uh, poem Das Nordlicht, the Northern Lights, uh, he had written a longer treatise back in, I believe it was 1912 or something like that. He quotes, Der Feind ist unsere eigene Frage als Gestalt, which can be translated in various nuanced ways, but basically uh, means something along the lines of, uh, uh, let's just see where I wrote that down basically just means something along the lines of the enemy is our own question as a figure. And uh, this basically harks back at or sounds a lot like Derrida's notion of the other in everyone's own soul being responsible for every decision because when one makes a decision his enemy, his uh, talking in a in a in a psychoanalytic psychoanalyt psychoanalytical way, his shadow or whatever might be the the the, the other side of the coin of his soul, uh, without wanting to sound too dramatic here, uh, forfeits his right to interject more or less. Otherwise, the decision would be another one, and. Uh, by this concentration on the other as a main motif of politics and their respective philosophy all in all, I believe we have a common ground to bring together 
Schmidian and Derridean thought to a productive synthesis, which we hope to do in the next stream. Back to you, Tyler. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, so uh, the people that just arrived, um, our, the rest of the guests must have got the time wrong or something because no show. So we're just doing this as a prelude by giving the background information. And then next week will be the full engagement with Derrida. So with that in mind and what Nils just uh, introduced to us, I'm going to take the audience through demystifying what Derrida's deconstructive reading of Schmidt actually entails. So to start off by in this process of demystification, and to understand deconstruction properly, you have to look at the work of deconstruction. And that's to take two mutually opposing terms, such as like male or female, or speech versus writing, or reason versus passion, and to show how through an examination of texts in the Western philosophical tradition, in which one of these terms is privileged over another. And so what Derrida's work does is he demonstrates how each of the terms are not self-standing. So they're not self-sufficient meanings on their own, but rather each of the two terms in these oppositional binaries, they constitute the other. So the work of deconstruction is not to dismantle meaning in order to create some sort of nihilism in which you simply reverse the hierarchy, but rather it's to disseminate new possibilities outside of stable opposition. So the term disseminate here, think about seminate seed, that you're splattering all these different possibilities that are created by letting these oppositions play off each other and to see how they constitute each other in order to come up with new possibilities. So the basis for Derrida's early work where he develops the concept of deconstruction, it comes out of an engagement with uh, Edmund Husserl, the German philosopher, over the question of how presence, and presence here means an access to the object or idea in its fullness, in which we can there be said to grasp that object or that idea. It comes to you in its fullness, you have the idea, it's not mediated. And Derrida's early work shows how that process is always bound up with what he calls difference and substitution. So that would mean that there's an absent origin at the heart of presence, which never actually appears to consciousness, but it's always mediated through a series of substitutions and repetitions that is in itself the condition of meaning in which these meanings become sedimented over time through this process of signs, speaking to another signs, pointing to other signs, because all these linguistic signs that we use only get their meaning by opposition to other ones, rather than being self-sufficient. So I won't quite get into the debate between Husserl and Derrida on this subject. It's a little more, um, a little outside the scope for here, but it's something I'll get into at another time. But regardless, to turn to the deconstructive reading of Schmidt, I'm sure everyone here in the audience and the panel is familiar with how the liberal world order depoliticizes everything with its reduction of what we call properly political questions to ethical questions or the reduction from the political to the market and creating this sphere of private beliefs that are separate from the secular neutral space or the idea of politics as a mere vehicle for rational efficiency calculation. So the idea that political antagonisms are eradicated with the development of post-conventional identities, the adoption of the language of universal human rights, and the adoption of a, the idea of a common humanity. And so what this creates is a political philosophy only able to swim within liberal premises that are aimed at establishing a moral consensus. So with these antagonisms that are the precondition for d political decisions and deliberation, they become obscured because they're a part of, said to be a part of civil society. So they're not within the realm of the political. So liberal world order obscures these antagonisms as being not political. So the point that Schmidt's making is that the political comes before the constitution of law. And so Schmidt's critique is aimed at the depoliticization and the creation of these various social spheres that make up civil society, which as an antithesis of the political state, it requires us to create distinctions at the most basic contentless level as an antidote. So that would be Schmidt's famous uh, friend enemy distinction, which is the properly political. So he uses that distinction to show how 
the political transcends the spheres that are relegated to civil society. So those spheres are things like, you know, the religion, the arts, uh, the sphere of economic and technical efficiency, because obviously all these spheres can become politicized. You're in one religious community, you have a dispute with another or within that religious community and they become political actors. So what he means that the friend enemy distinction is contentless is meant to describe that when these spheres become political through making decision, it's this decision that makes the political its own. So this becoming political occurs through the process of language, which means that all the terms are meant to designate it, who you're fighting, who you're negating, what you're appropriating, who is effective, who you are denouncing. So in typical liberal language, we designate these actors within a political crisis or a war as non-political, as immoral, because what we call the political world order is only a universal liberal homogenous state. So what comes up in opposition to that is designated as an enemy of humanity. So it's a way of saying that liberal politic is superior. It's the only political game in town. So this critique of liberalism that Schmidt is making is that it forecloses the possibility of the political to make governance. And so the actual workings of power and sovereignty become more obscure. So to turn to how Derrida sets out to deconstruct this friend-enemy distinction, it needs to be so that Derrida is not trying to overturn the distinction or to privilege just one term over the other, as critics tend to say that he does, but to get at the concepts, the concept's own identity and the difference that's contained within itself. So in The Politics of Friendship, which is the text that we were supposed to be discussing today, Derrida is meditating on friendship and democracy. And Derrida describes democracy as always a democracy to come. It's never fully arrived. And the reason he describes it as such is because he says the system has what's called autoimmunity. So it means that it creates unsolvable tensions in order for democracy to function. So in the sense that democracy needs people to be equal. And then, so that requires them to be counted equally regardless of their particular circumstances. But then that obviously co conflicts with the idea of freedom, the freedom to individualize, to actualize, and that freedom creates a difference between one of these units and another. So Derrida thinks that democracy is always at tension. It's always at war with itself. It's never fully arrived. So what Derrida wants to show in his reading of Schmidt, Schmidt is that his concept of the political relies on the becoming political through the rhetorical process, whereby subjectification, which is a process in which uh, these political categories and these identities for the groups, they occur alongside and they're inseparable from the moment of decision. So the poles of the friend enemy distinction, they come to contaminate one another. And so you can't neatly put them aside for Derrida. They contaminate each other because that process of subjectification occurs along with the decision. And so this responsibility and this irresponsibility toward the other, and uh, Nils here mentioned the, the other as a category for Derrida, which he takes over from another Jewish philosopher named Emmanuel Levinas, where he argues that responsibility towards the other is prior to metaphysics, it's prior to ontology, it's the origin of the self, it's this responsibility to the other. So that toward this responsibility infuses an ethical question into the depoliticalization under liberalism. So it's liberalism always defers responsibility and it defers decision. So Derrida, he takes up the private public distinction under liberalism and he shows how private enmity, so like your hate and your feelings towards others that occur and what the space is called private, that's somehow separate from the public within political uh, liberal ideology, which nonetheless in reality doesn't really work that way. So it's always contaminating each other. And so he shows that what is not yet considered political with the political making con political makes conflict public through the construction of enemies, right? So it's always an ism, it's always an Islam or a communism or a fascism, or it's the Orient. And so it creates a situation in which you can hate your enemy publicly. So you hate communists, you hate fascists, you hate uh, whatever category you can think of and when we justify various different wars and conflicts. But you could also love them in private. So because you can love them in private and hate them publicly and vice versa, what this is meant to show is that political distinctions, for Derrida, they depend on non-political distinctions. 
So Derrida is collapsing the border by showing how one realm comes to constitute the other, that there's no pure enemy. So Derrida's deconstructive reading is meant to bring out that within Schmidt's categories in which he tries to designate the pure friend and the pure enemy, Derrida would think that Schmidt is trying to get a handle on the flux. And so the flux here meaning this unceaseless change. And so Schmidt's erected this tradition as a safeguard against it while Derrida's saying there is no pure enemy, there is no pure friend. So then Derrida, he's still making a case for a Schmidtian decisionism except one in which the possibility of making enemies into friends for the purpose of a democracy that is always to come, but never arises, arrives. So that's the background for Derrida in a nutshell. So I hope that helps out. Um, yeah, Martin, is there anything you want to bring up for the audience? I know you had something you wanted. Yes, there was something that I wanted to say, and it was uh, it was kind of what I got from the uh, reading that I read of uh, Derrida and of Schmidt beforehand, before I went to this conversation. And it's that, um, according to Schmidt, uh, wait, no, 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 no. Um, it's like in Karl Schmidt's conception of the political, according to Derrida, he wants to appeal to a platonic logic that will help ground his polemical conception of the political. And when this is done, then what is expressed is the purity of the political. But according to Derrida, there's a problem with this grounding. It has to do with it being contaminated, as you have already said, Thamster. Contaminated how? It is contaminated in how when it comes to the acting out of the political, otherwise known the use of contentious rhetoric and of having the fight to tie and take sides, i.e. to have to distinguish between friend and enemy. This brings us back to what was discussed in the previous stream concerning the problem of democracy. The problem of democracy is therefore similar to the problem of a static logic with limits what a sovereign can do and act out according to like how he engages in the politics. According to this analysis, one cannot think of politics as the expression of a purity already thought of in advance, and one cannot think of it as the platonic project if one will then go on to support the politics which asserts that in times of crisis, when the liberal order gives way to the unpredictable realm of action, it is of great necessity to maintain the civility of the state to have someone who Karl Schmidt calls the sovereign come in and override all the bureaucratic limitations of how, uh, because of how these bureaucratic um, functions of the government slow down the decision-making process. And as has been mentioned already, sovereignty comes about most urgently in times when an ultimate decision has to be made. Derrida, as a deconstructionist, tends to focus on what th thinkers of the past privilege and what thinkers exclude from their discourse. These can be ideas, words, or even the kinds of anthropological facts that tend to justify the kind of ethnocentrism which Derrida has stated many times over what he would that which that he wants to weaken because of how it can they can be used to afford a totalitarian project of euphoric violence full of ecstasy, which derives its pleasure out of the annihilation of what you so called the other, you know, Derrida's preoccupation with the other. Preventing this annihilation is both for Derrida simultaneously figurative and actual. In fact, the former here can in some respects be conjoined with the latter. Um, and if this is the case, that the figurative violence is near synonymous to the perpetuation of real violence, then this has the possibility of giving way to the kinds of hate speech codes that the left so desires to want to implement in both private and public spheres of influence. So with Carl Schmidt, Derrida claims that he wishes to exclude from his conception of the purity of politics all other purity, and this means excluding objective, scientific, moral, judicial, and psychological purity. Because of these forms of purity, they may contaminate his goal of pushing for the only purity that he wishes to conserve, and that is the purity of the political. Derrida thinks this goal is both platonic and, in a way, an, an a priori vision of asserting the truth through a political logic that is doomed to fail from the beginning. It is, in his words, a priori doomed to fail. Um, uh, there is more that I could say, but because this is a prelude, um, I will probably leave it at that. Uh, that's kind of what I got out of the, uh, uh, right, re writings of, of both Schmidt and of, uh, of the politics of friendship, which we have here. So a lot of what I like already thought of beforehand was, was in a way kind of stated by you, but, um, um, but, and some of it wasn't, but like, you know, like you did like kind of reach into the topics of the other and you've reached into the topics of, uh, of like private and public, you know, space and influence in politics and what that means for the friend and the enemy distinction. So like, you know, there's definitely an overlap, overlap between like the thoughts that I've had with these texts and what you have already said, uh, faster. So I think I'm uh, for now done. Um, so there we go.
All right, so we've given the basis for what Derrida's deconstructive reading is um, of Schmidt. Nils, is there anything you wanted to add? All right, so, you know, I think just because uh, the proper show is not happening today, I think we're going to take this an extra mile. Let's fuck it, I'll take a shot at it. But I said I wasn't going to talk about where Derrida and deconstruction comes from in his early work in the sense of how he actually builds up his understanding that gives way to this process of deconstruction. And that comes off his early engagement with Husserl. But for the sake of the audience, I think I'll do it. So see how best I can produce this on the spot. So Derrida's early work comes with engaging the early work of Edmund Husserl, particularly um, the reading within Husserl's text called The Logical Investigations. So The Logical Investigations is a text that is trying to ground philosophy on a new science which is called eidetic science and eidetic science meaning um, the idea it's trying to grasp the fundamental idea of what makes a particular mental structure or abstract category like a mathematical number of uh, a, a, a platonic form you might say he's trying to grasp the essential that makes the kind of mental experience and the kind of object what it is. So what he proposes to do is to perform what's called a reduction, which is where you eliminate your common sense understanding of the world so that you might, might then, then describe how these different experiences come to consciousness. And so you see how they're constituted in order to describe what is the, um, what is the essential structure that makes an act what it is. And the only way for Husserl to do that is through the process of uh, description. Now, to get to where Derrida critiques Husserl, I'll have to give a bit of background. But I should be noted that I'm not a Derridian, and I actually think that this interpretation of Husserl that Derrida offers is actually very flawed for, that, for a number of reasons. So take that with a grain of salt. So Husserl creates what's called the distinction between expressions and indications. And so he's giving a philosophy of language. He's saying an indication is when you're speaking to another that you have linguistic signs that are standing in place of your direct experience of an object that you have in your mind. So when I'm describing something in the world, I'm communicating, I have to use language, I have to use signs. So that would mean that in communication, you're bound to indications. You're always indicating, you're never able to particularly give exactly the pure presence that you have in your mental space. While expressions for Husserl, when you're speaking to yourself, you have direct relation with what you're thinking. So that would be the expression between expressions and indications. And now the pure, the point, the, the importance of that is that expression is where these ideas and Derrida's reading of Husserl are given their full presence. It's where you come to, you have an understanding of them. And so it plays a role for Husserl in trying to um, elaborate on the transcendental constitution and direct access that you have to objects in the world. So when you perform the eidetic reduction, you cut off the world and you cut off any other indication that's going to prevent you from directly grasping one of these objects or one of these ideas. So Derrida wants to show that Husserl can't sustain that, that there's always indication right down, all the way down to your conscious self in the sense that consciousness is never directly accessing the world, it's always mediated. So how he proposes to show that is by reading Husserl against Husserl, which is to say he takes Husserl's idea of internal time consciousness and puts it against Husserl himself in order to say that there is no pure ego pole that you can go back to. So to go back to Husserl again, what is internal time consciousness? Okay, so internal time consciousness is Husserl's examination of how what he calls an extended object, how that appears to consciousness. So like you're listening to a piece of music, for example. If you listen to music as a series of static notes that enter into your brain, but it's never con constituted as a kind of flow, then you would experience these notes very disjointed. You'd experience them individually. It wouldn't become a coherent song. So the extended object is an object that's extended across across time, and but nonetheless is a coherent object. So Husserl's three-layered examination of this starts from what's called the retention. So retention is when you retain the previous and 
the previous note. And then the pro tension is the future anticipation. So consciousness is always anticipating the future while retaining the past. And that this play of retention and pro tension creates something called the primal impression. So the primal impression is like um, your experience of the now point. And so the interest, the point about the interesting point about this is that when you're thinking, if you try to say, what time is it now? Like, is it now, now or now, now? It's always slipping into the future and you're always retaining the present. And so this, this primal impression is at the origin of the temporality of the self for Husserl. So what does Derrida do with this? Well, Derrida, what he shows is that because the retention and the protension, it's always mediated by signs standing for other signs. That means that this primal impression, this now point, is never something that's pure. It's, there's never this pure grasp of the object in which you can say it's a now. But rather because you're always moving in time, then you need that you need these linguistic signs to mediate for your past relation. So ultimately what happens in Derrida's view is that it's language and signs all the way down. There's no peer mediate, there's no peer relation to the world. So therefore there is no such thing as expressions, it's indications all the way down. So how does this play into the concept of deconstruction? So deconstruction is saying that because there's no stable self-identity, which he takes over from Husserl's internal time consciousness, that therefore all these single meanings that we ascribe to these signs are always founded on one contaminating another. There, it's always opposition. It's always a series of differences. When, therefore, the idea that Husserl is trying to get at, this peer presence never appears. So the origin of these ideas is never directly accessible by consciousness, but it's always mediated through linguistic signs. So this is, so taking that insight from Husserl is the basis of deconstruction. So the early work of Derrida, contrary to what a lot of people think, is not exactly just playing around with complicated words, but he is actually trying to understand epistemology. He's trying to understand how we understand objects in the world and the like. And so, yeah, there we go. So that's that's my basic intro to where Derrida develops deconstruction from, but I figured I would give that for the audience just for more background sake, because we couldn't do what we intended on doing. Yeah, anything you guys want to add before I close this up? Um, I believe it's a bit to chew for everyone listening so far. So I guess everyone uh, who wants to has uh, some points to read into regarding Derrida and deconstructivism and the other as a concept before we get into the thick of it the next time. Definitely, for sure. Um, Nils, how much time do you got? Because it uh, looks like our other guy just is finally around. Um, None. Uh, uh, like like minus one hour. <laughs> All right, man. So we'll do this next week. So apologies to the audience, but I hope that at least what we give here was a good prelude. So that way that when we talk, tackle Derrida, where you have something at your toolbox, be able to understand and to engage with us and ask questions and the like. But thank you all for supporting and we will see you next week. Grumpy Mug says bye. Bye. See ya.